Um, first thing on the agenda is call to the public. We have Sarah Chavez. Come on down. How are you doing, Sarah? And the mic's yours. Yeah, Ready? about two minutes. Okay. My name is Sarah Chavez. I'm a registered nurse and a resident of District 3. And I just want to bring about the um, public health concern for the safety of the bicycling community. In the city of Phoenix, um, the 2015 bicycle collision summary reports that there's over uh, 450 bicycle collisions with 400 injuries and 11 deaths every year on average over the last, last five years. And 93% of cyclists involved in a collision result in an injury or death. Um, and it's only estimated that about a half um, bicyclists wear helmets. And the CDC report that the leading cause of accidental death among children are from traumatic brain injuries following a bicycle accident. So to address this concern, I would like to propose a policy to mandate bicycle helmets in the city of Phoenix. Um, 22 states and 201 localities have implemented mandatory by, uh, helmet laws. It's associated with a 19% reduction in um, juvenile fatalities. And the Bicycle Safety Institute reports head injuries account for more than 60% of bicycle-related deaths and estimates that up to 88% of cyclists can avoid traumatic vein injury with the use of a helmet. And that um, cyclists, if they were in a helmet, are 14 times more likely to be involved in a fatal crash. Um, I'm sorry, non-helmeted riders versus helmeted riders. So the following recommendations, um, I'm proposing that all cyclists in all locations wear a helmet in all locations that a, a bicycling is permitted and to implement programs to include bicycle safety education, helmet use promotion and program evaluation by partnering with local health department, police department, and advocacy groups such as Phoenix spokespeople um, and the League of American Bicyclists. And we could partner with local bicycle shop owners to give dis discount coupons to overcome the barriers of the cost of the helmet for the public. And also to, to make it enforceable by giving a warning. Am I done? Okay. Um, warning paired with educating the rider and the importance of the helmet use for the first offense and then to pose a fine for any subsequent violation. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those great ideas. Uh, Sarah, what I'll do is I got your card here, and I'll pass that information to Don Cross that really helps us out a lot with um, safety. And we have actually in each district, we give out about a thousand helmets to um, kids and, and family members. And uh, I'll make sure that he gets in contact with you for some other ideas. OK, great. Thank you. So with that, we're on item number um, one, which is approval of the minutes of September 13, 2017. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries. We're on um, items two and three, which are consent items. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? It passes. And we're on item number four. So it's yours, Chief. Chairman Nowakowski, members of the subcommittee, we're here today to talk to you about the request that we discussed with you back in July regarding the additional police officers to get us to a staffing level of 2.5 per 1,000. At that discussion, we talked about the need, if we were to do something like that, we couldn't just add the police officers in isolation. We had to look at all the ancillary services and all the ancillary other costs that would be involved with that. Everything from infrastructure to additional staff in public works, the courts, prosecutor and all of those other departments that would be impacted. So that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Um, at that meeting, we also, Chief Kurtenbach discussed with you at length some discussion about whether or not that 2.5 officers per 1,000 or an officer per 1,000 ratio should be actually cited or used as a staffing methodology. And Chief Kurtenbach spoke um, you know, at length about that. There's also been some additional information that just came out just two weeks ago from Leonard Matarese from the Center of Public Safety Management 
in concert with the ICMA, he released a study about um, regarding staffing ratios specifically, five myths about police staffing metrics. Um, in that, he basically talks about that there really is no strong correlation between staffing ratios and crime and, and things of that, of that nature. So um, I can forward that information to you if you'd like to read that as well. But I've got with me Amber Williamson. She's my Deputy Budget and Research Director. She took over the position that I used to have, so she's becoming the public safety expert. We'll take a little time for her to get there, but she's getting there. And she's going to actually walk you through all of the detailed discussions and, and the conversation about what it takes to actually staff at this level. And I believe, Chairman Nowakowski, you also asked if we were to do something like this, not only what's the cost, but how would we get there? What are the funding methodologies to get there? And so that's what Amber will walk you through. Chairman Nowakowski and members of the subcommittee. So as Jeff indicated, back in June, we had provided the estimated cost to add 837 additional officers. That estimate was 125 million, and it only accounted for the cost of the sworn staff, basic equipment, and vehicles at a ratio of two to one. Those estimates do not account for future compensation increases or any leadership positions, which would increase the estimated costs. So over the summer, we met with several city departments to try to gather information to determine the ancillary expenses that would be required to increase the sworn count by 837. For the police department, we're presenting you with a range which represents different infrastructure options. The low end of 60 million accounts for adding 300 civilian staff, which is based on an existing civilian to sworn ratio as of today. Also space needs for different um, infrastructure needs, such as building a new police precinct, adding a central booking facility, and then also remodeling the um, basement and the police headquarters to accommodate the increase in the civilian staff. The high end of the range of 175 million also accounts for the civilian staff building an additional police precinct, a new central booking facility, but it accounts for constructing a new police headquarters. So as the report indicates, the existing headquarters is over 40 years old and it is in need of extensive maintenance and repair. So we included that in that higher end. Next is the court. The estimate of 6.6 .6 million accounts for adding an additional 70 civilian staff, and that's also based on the method of looking at the current civilian to sworn ratio. Using that same method for the law department, it would be roughly 5.5 million, accounting for the addition of 50 civilian staff. And then finally, the public works department. 5.2 million would account for adding civilian staff to perform various equipment management and facilities maintenance functions, as well as constructing an additional vehicle bay and costs for parts and fuel to accommodate the increase in the fleet. So that brings our total estimated ancillary expenses to a range of 77 million to 192 million. When you add in the 125 million for the sworn expense, you're looking at a total estimated cost to add 837 officers of roughly 202 million up to 317 million. That amount does include ongoing costs of 153 million, which are mainly for personnel. You would also question, ask us. A question I'm really sorry. quick if you go back. Yes. We have police, 300 civilians, space needed, equipment, et cetera. Without building out the um, police headquarters, would that be $115 million less? Um, for the build out of the basement, or you mean constructing a new police headquarters? Constructing a new police headquarters. The estimate to construct the new police headquarters would be roughly $125 million. Thank you. Council member. Who are all those civilian positions? The civilian, I'm sorry, Councilwoman Williams. The civilian positions um, include various different um, positions for things like communications dispatchers, the lab, crime scene staff, um, positions for all the specialty bureaus, administrative functions. We have a list from the police department that they gave us that totals that amount, and we can, we can provide that to you if you need to. And for the court and, and for law? For the court and for the um, law department, we just looked at the existing sworn to civilian ratio in each department, and we used that percent as a factor to apply against the 837 officers. And, and one of the things I want to interject, Councilman um, Williams and members of the subcommittee, is when you look at the staffing ratios that we have now, looking at the number of 837 police officers or positions that will be actually on the street, that's going to create additional citations, additional workload for the police department, but not only the police department. The prosecutor's office will have to handle more cases. The courtrooms will have to have more folks available to actually have courtrooms open. So it's all of that support staff. As the Amber mentioned, you know, it's, it's the crime scene folks, it's the lab folks, it's the communications operators, the dispatchers, into the judges, hearing officers, prosecutors, clerks, 
everything that goes in into that. On the public work side, it's the staff that maintain the facilities. It'd be the staff that maintains the police officers' vehicles. Is that also included? In, sounds like we would be arresting more people, more jail costs. Yes, that's included in a number as well. Thank you. Okay, so the you had asked us back in June as well when we come back to talk about the required resources that would be necessary to cover that expenditure range of two hundred two million to three hundred seventeen million. As Jeff had indicated back in June, the existing operating budget can't obviously it doesn't have the capacity to absorb that level of increase in expenditures. So we modeled looking at an increase in either the sales tax rate or reinstating a food tax. So for every zero point one percent increase in the local sales tax rate, that generates roughly twenty nine million dollars. And for every 1% food tax, it generates roughly $26 million. So it would require an increase to the local sales tax rate of anywhere from 0.68% up to 1.09%. Or if you were to elect to implement the food tax, it would require a food tax rate of 7.7% up to 12.3% to generate the revenues necessary to cover that expenditure range. Those estimates were based on prior sales tax receipts and you could also consider using a combination of the both. Another consideration is that the one-time expenses, which would be for the infrastructure needs, could be paid for from a new bond program. If that were elected, then you would require a lower sales tax rate increase or a lower food tax rate to cover the ongoing expenses, which are primarily for staff. And that concludes our presentation. We can answer any questions. Uh, Any questions from my staff? And then, I mean, from our colleagues, yeah, and we I'm actually have. Now. I'm sorry, <laughs> my colleagues, and we, we have. Always knew it. <laughs> Go for it, oh, Vice Mayor. I'm ready. Okay. It says every one percent in food tax. We don't have a food tax. So if you were to are, implement, is the suggestion to? Uh, go for a food tax? So Council or Vice Mayor Pastor, at the last meeting, we discussed how would we pay for the 837 officers, which at that time was 125 million. So what we're looking at here today is, again, emphasizing what Amber's already addressed and what we already know, the existing general fund budget cannot absorb, cannot absorb this cost. Um, you know, this is a pretty significant hit to the general fund if this was something that we were to look at. So we looked at options for funding that. The only two revenue streams that could theoretically fund this type of cost would be an increase in either this general sales tax or an increase or implementing or reinstating the food tax. And so that's what you have before you. Okay, because I heard food tax and then I heard bond. The bond, if again, when Amber talked about those total costs, and if you go back to that slide, we talked about the cost for hard costs, such as facilities, infrastructure. You don't necessarily have to cover those costs through an increase in sales tax or food tax. You could do a bond, a bond program. Typically, a bond program is paid for with property tax. And, and so that would require typically, or more likely, a, a property tax increase to cover those types of things. And I guess my question, my second, third question would be, what happens if we don't do any of that and we still choose to go down this road or choose to sure. what uh, what is the programming or what are the departments that then would be affected would be affected sure. so in context the total cost that you see there of 200 to 300 million dollars essentially um, the general fund budget as a whole is about 1.3 billion dollars so you'd be looking at you know 20 25 percent of the general fund budget that you'd have to eliminate so you'd be looking at programs in parks, libraries, streets, all of those departments that the general fund currently supports. You'd have to eliminate services and programs to direct those dollars to the police department to add these additional officers. So one of the things that we've been dancing around the issue about hiring more police officers. So what we did is we asked staff to go back and to actually look at possible ways of hiring those 2.5 per thousand and basically come up with suggestions and and basically that's what this conversation is about is that if we want more police officers these are different methods or ways that we can actually um, hire more police officers at 837 to get to that 2.5 the other thing is without cutting any of the services that we have right now which is from our parks and, and libraries and senior centers and all that so that's the conversation that we asked for, and, 
and they came back with this information. It's not suggesting that we're going to have a sales tax or a food tax. It's just if we want to actually hire those 837 additional officers, this is what it would take without touching any other fund. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, we had a food tax. What percent was that? Uh, at the time we implemented the food tax, it was 2%. And then if you remember, it got weaned down to 1% and then finally it, it was eliminated. So to fund this, you're talking uh, almost 8 to 12. If you did it exclusively on food tax, correct. Is, does anybody in this valley have a food tax like that? No, they do not. On the sales tax, how do we rate right now and what would that put us to so if we if currently we our, our sales tax is about 2.3 percent that puts us roughly in the middle of all the other cities in the valley um, if we were to increase um, to this level we would be considerably at, at the higher end of, of that of that range you know my fear is when we do that is um, one the reaction from the food tax the last time was not very positive and two it tends to drive people to other cities and especially any new companies coming in uh, look at that as part of where they're going to locate their business and it's definitely the consumers where they're going to shop i know it made a, a big difference last time so i have real concerns about that and, and that's a councilwoman williams that's a legitimate concern especially on the retail sales tax side when you start to increase your sales tax rate, you have to be careful of what you're increasing it by because for large purchases, people will start to shop in different cities with a lower rate. They're not going to do that for the smaller purchases, but your larger purchases, cars and things like that, yes, they, they do start. And then ultimately the impact that has is it starts to draw down or reduce our sales tax collections. Thank you. Who's on the phone? Um, Kate, is that Councilwoman, Councilwoman um, Gagos, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. Already. We're, we have a couple cards here. Should we go ahead and listen to the public? Okay, Ms. Um, Barker, come on down. Thank you, uh, Councilman Nowkowski. I am in your district, and thank you for recognizing the constituent. And I just want to say, first of all, some of the police that know me, uh, you can't arrest me. I'm already arrested. But uh, no, some of them know me. I live downtown. And I'm in general support of the city of uh, Phoenix Police. Matter of fact, even with the problems that I've incurred in other people, I think that it is the best in the valley, the, certainly the friendliest. Now, where I'm going with this is, is the city council, the policies all lead to what kind of monies the city management's going to end up with unless the city management is really, really poor. And I think that we've seen an increase in trying to tighten things with the city management. The thing is, is we've been giving big developers great big tax breaks. And then people that are, are longtime property owners, good citizens, they have to take it. They have to take this tax increase. A simple noise complaint, I had my windows open, it was before we started getting more businesses downtown, brought four male police officers and one female to my door on a Friday at 7 p.m. And I opened the door and I says, well, hi, come on in, you know. I was dressed up to go to a party. Well, they said, oh, gee, we don't think anything's here. Is it really the need for more officers or is it the operations? Why have that happen? I can give you some other incidences. And the other thing is whenever you do anything, there are consequences. You hire a lot more officers. You got good intentions. You need much more money for training. Because as we know, as a simple citizen, I have won up to four cases in city court. And I love that court because the judge listens, listens to the law and then applies it 
to the city. They should have a mediation for particularly these young officers that aren't familiar with the laws and their citizens that know that they've written them up wrong. And you're going to get a lot more of that. And I still have a case where the uh, police didn't do right. And it's not going to be cured until it's done right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barker. John. I would like to talk a little bit about some of the building that's going on and some of the tax breaks that all of these uh, developers are getting. In my neighborhood, every piece of property they're building uh, either Condos, huge condos, or apartments, and the, the traffic on Indian School Road at the time of work, at 8, 9 o'clock, is from one stoplight to the other stoplight. So we're building these apartments. We're put, putting the... Uh, automobile traffic is going crazy in that neighborhood. They got to do something. You got to stop some of the building. Who are, we, who are we going to put in all that building? Who? There's every uh, neighborhood has got two or three apartment houses going up and they're still going up. We got to stop something. So if you don't do something now and start taxing the people, the developers, the way they should be taxed, this is where we're going. The little people like me are going to pay for it. Thank you, John. Uh, Ms. Houston. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vivica D. Houston, and I just want to um, promote uh, the idea of young, um, gifted, um, brave, and, and clean living black children, um, teens, um, being interested in becoming police officers. And I think they don't get any field trips over here. They don't get any tours. Um, the, the, the awesome um, black police officers don't visit their schools and give a testimonial. These young people need to be infected between the, the age of 12 to 15 or seventh grade to sophomore year of high school. So they'll aim in that direction and you give them something to aim at. You see how they are with football. You see how they are with basketball. They will be great police officers. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Houston. Um, we have our um, president of our firefighters, Steve. Good morning. All right. Good. I was watching Channel 15 News this morning, and I heard about this meeting. <laughs> So here I am. Uh, my name is Steve Berline. I'm uh, the president of the United Phoenix Firefighters Association. I'm a, also a captain with the Phoenix Fire Department. I work right over here on Ladder 1, and I reside in the Northwest Valley. Um, I'm here to support our, our brothers and sisters in blue, as, as we call them. Um, we are on the street with them. After the sun goes down, we feel like we, all we have is each other sometimes. So we, we see their staffing needs, um, most definitely. But I'd be remiss if I didn't speak on behalf of the brothers and sisters in red who I also represent. So we are public safety. So I have a, I have a request. When, when staff starts looking at these statistics, I, I have a request that you also look at entire public safety. Look at the fire department response time. How long does it take to a fire truck on average to get to the, uh, uh, somebody's home when they're in need? And they make that 911 call to when that um, truck shows up. We have an increase of over 40,000 calls a year in the last couple of years and no increase of resources to run these calls. 
we have an in incredible sprawl with the great growth this awesome city is, has had, but we are falling short of providing service, essential services to those areas. We know about the North Valley and their lack of coverage for fire and EMS services. And when I say not North Valley, I'm not talking about a neighborhood. I'm talking about Deer Valley to Anthem from the city of Glendale to the city of Scottsdale. It could be a quarter of the entire city of Phoenix is grossly understaffed when it comes to fire service. Deer Valley Airport, one of the busiest general aviation air airports in the entire country, does not have any aviation fire protection staff training or equipment. They're, they're standing alone. We've been waiting a long time. The, the Southwest Valley, uh, grossly short. The crews are running hard. They're doing the best they can, but there's only so much we can do with the resources we have. Ahwatukee, as we see that freeway in the West Valley get built, that area is going to boom. So as important and vital as PD staffing is, we, we got their backs. We truly believe. But fire and EMS is another essential service that the city needs to provide. So my request to you all today is to include fire and EMS statistics with the statistics that the uh, staff will be accumulating over the next couple months. Thank you, Steve. Thank and maybe you. for our next meeting, we can actually have those statistics and response times and of fire also. I think we have, yeah. I would like the same analysis that we're doing for public safety or police. I would like to see the same analysis uh, for fire. Um, the difference will be response times and, and how that works, but um, uh, I don't think we asked. No, Vi Vice Mayor Pastor, for us, for us to do anything like that for fire, you'd have to tell us again, the way we came up with this was a ratio. So the ratio that we had for police was an assumption of, or wanting a desire to get to 2.5 officers per 1,000. So you would have to tell us essentially what staffing level you're asking us to divide or deliver for the fire department. What I'd like to see is our response time. I know that there's some type of a triangle of response time. And if we can start looking at those um, fire stations and the response times, especially with our city growing, especially in the North Valley and the Southwest, um, with the future freeway and future development, what that response, what it would be, um, staffing we would need to make sure that that response time is on target and um, i think it's what four minutes or so steve or yeah there, there is a, a maybe if you can come to the microphone yeah and if you can kind of explain to people watching what that response time and how do you have well it. and we do uh, have a ratio uh, that across the country that we try to reach and it's one per 1,000 per capita now you have to consider the Phoenix Fire Department is different than most most fire departments provide fire and EMS service we do a great job of providing that but we also provide a transportation component so those are uh, cross-trained firefighters but their role is transportation so they don't play as a greater part in fire suppression. So if you're going to look at that one to 1,000 for firefighters, as they do across the country, you need to carve out the personnel who are hired to staff the transportation component of the Phoenix Fire Department. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, I, I thank you very much for bringing that up because I know that uh, in the North Valley, we have received a petition uh, asking, it was a fire station that was in the bond program that didn't get built, and the response times are very, very poor, and a lot of people are very concerned. We, I, I fully support asking you to come back with um, a review of what the fire department has. I also think it's important to, as part of that analysis, I understand they have a shortage of equipment that uh, we have. Uh, shortage of ladder trucks and some other very old aging uh, equipment and I, I'd like to see as a review if we ever talk about a bond program or anything other uh, revenue that could be used I think it's extremely important uh, lives depend on that 
Uh, I'm not saying anything against the police. Don't want you to take that because everybody knows I come from a police family. I'm very pro-police. But I also know that uh, you don't have a lot of time when you find a child floating in a pool or responding to a heart attack or wrong way drivers on I-17. Uh, so I just think it's important that we analyze and recognize as a council uh, where we're at, truly, because I, this cannot go on forever, and I think it's important that we recognize what our real priorities are in this city and begin to figure out a way uh, to address all those issues. Thank you. We have um, one more speaker that we have two cards that are donated to um, the president of um, PLEA, Ken. We have a total of about six minutes or so. Uh, good morning, Councilman and members of the panel. Again, Ken Crane with the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. I serve as the president of uh, PLEA. And I'm going to probably sound like a bit of a ro broken record. For well over a year, we've been beating the drum on police manpower issues. And uh, so when we saw it on the agenda, we wanted to address it yet again. We are uh, obviously in favor of staffing up to 2.5 per thousand. Um, we have uh, crunched numbers and done our own research. We're in the top 10 cities. When you average staffing the law in the top 10 cities, it comes out to 2.5. Even if you knock out off the outliers, the high and the low end, it comes out to 2.5. Uh, there's a lot of things that we've seen up here that we agree with. And here's the first thing. We all know that cops and firefighters are not cheap. Public safety is expensive. We know it takes 70 to 75% of the general fund of a city to pay for cops and firefighters. It's, that, it's not a news flash, it's that way around the country, okay? And it's, there's a term for that, it's a technical labor term, it's called the cost of doing business, okay? That's just the way it is. Everybody wants platinum, top shelf, highly trained public safety, but nobody, it's just that nobody wants to pay for it. It's a little bit of a rub there, a little bit of a contradiction. So. A couple of points. Um, as you guys know, we surpassed Philadelphia for the fifth largest city recently. A couple of stats that are important is that Philly encompasses 140 square miles. The city of Phoenix encompasses 530 square miles. Philly staffs their PD at around 6,000 officers. That's what they advertise on their website. By next summer, the, you know, by next summer, hopefully. Phoenix PD will be up to 3125. Okay, so let that sink in for a minute. Um, the population of Philly, about 1.5 million, word of roughly about 1.6 million. So we're more population, we're at least quadruple the size of Philly. And if we get up to 3125 next summer, they'll still have double the cops that we have. All right? Ahwatukee, a community with a population of 70,000. <clears> then on any given day usually has around two cops patrolling down there. The city of Prescott, population of 40,000, they boast a 65-man police department. That's problematic. Our response times are still high. They're not where they should be. And we'll agree with staff that the last thing you want to do is staff a police department based on crime stats. Crime stats go up and down like a stock market graph. It's an unreliable indicator to staff a PD. The three most important components to staff off of, we believe, are the air, number one, the area of your city. How much square mileage do you have to cover? Number two, your population that you have to serve, okay? And number three, what are your current response times and where do you want those response times to ultimately be? Those should be your three driving factors on your staffing models. Um, so we know this is not a quick overnight magic wand fix we get that okay we are hiring now that's a good thing we're having bodies come through the pipeline and we're grateful for that but i'm here to tell you that this ultimate end goal of 3125 isn't going to cut it for a city our size it just isn't when you're covering the distances our men and women are covering out there that's why you need the manpower you got to have it okay and you got to be willing to pay for it so we're just asking that the mayor and council come up with a, a definitive, well-thought-out plan, a long-term plan on how we're going to get there and get our staffing and infrastructure up to where it needs to be. And, yeah, we need new buildings, too. 
We need police cars, too. Um, like I said, it's not cheap. Uh, the city charter gives the mayor and council the authority to assess fees and levy taxes. It's an unpleasant thing. We get it, okay? Everybody hates taxes, but, you know, we have to find the funding sources. So it's not unreasonable, and I don't think the citizens of Phoenix are going to find it unreasonable if we have to bump taxes up a little bit to get the public safety to where it needs to be with police and fire. Um, one of you on the panel, I can't remember who mentioned it yet, it's a, it's a delicate balancing act when we start bumping taxes because we might drive business away. And that's a true statement, okay? But let me tell you what else will drive business and residents away. Rising crime rates and rising police response times. And if you don't think major corporations don't do an in-depth analysis before they decide to relocate to a city, we all know that they do. They check all this stuff out. So public safety is the key. It's the cornerstone of any vibrant, thriving city. Everything proceeds from that. If you've got good public safety, you're going to attract residents. You'll build your tax base. You'll attract businesses. They'll want to come here. So again, just to wrap up, uh, we, we are in favor of the 2.5 per thousand. We think we just need to come up with a, a defined plan. I think we're making progress because I actually see 2.5 per thousand written on a piece of city paper here. So I think it's a huge step forward. But so I have hope. But uh, I just want to let you know where we stand on that, and our position has not changed. Thank you. Can you have forty seconds left? I'll defer. Alrighty. Oh, I just want to say, uh, Miss Houston, excellent point. Couldn't agree more. We need to, we need to work on that. So you made a really great point there. Thank you. Any comments from my colleagues? Mm -hmm. I believe this is a conversation that should be done in a work study or, or in, um, with the rest of my colleagues. I think mm -hmm. this is something that's so important that this information that we gathered, we over and over during our budget hearings, during um, our, our council meetings, we hear that we need more of public safety. And I think we finally came out with some hard numbers. And I think um, what Ken was talking about, um, how does Philadelphia do it? You know, I would like to see some of their, what, if they're actually using tax revenue to do that or what type of programs do they have compared to the city of Phoenix. I know that we invest 70 to 73% of our budget towards public safety. So we all believe that public safety is something very important. And that's why we actually approve budgets to to make sure that public safety is the top priority of our city. So I'd like to figure out what other cities are doing that, and see what the best practices are. Why does Philadelphia have twice more police officers than we do? I'm not sure how many firefighters compared to us neither. So you know, things like that I'd like to see maybe um, going to a full console or going to a work study so we can actually have that conversation with the rest of my colleagues. And with that, I'm not sure if there's any other questions or comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Are you going to be here to have the study session? All right, we're on item number five. <laughs> hey, Chief. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Nowakowski and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to get a, give a brief update on our urban search and rescue deployments to Hurricane Rita, or excuse me, Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Harvey. Um, with me, I have Scott Walker, Assistant Chief, and Assistant Chief Shelley Jamison, and both of these members accompanied the team. The picture you see up on the screen are the 80 members, um, 72 firefighters. We had four police officers that joined us for force protection, as well as some specialties that they had to bring to the table, as well as some structural engineers and physicians. So it was a successful deployment. They were gone 21 days. Um, this is an Arizona Task Force One is one of 28 teams around the country that provide um, emergency, emergency search and rescue capabilities to the country when a disaster occurs, and Phoenix is fortunate to be one of them. Um, all costs that occurred are completely covered by FEMA, reimbursed, so not only for the members that are going out, but also for the backfill required to keep our city safe during their deployment. So I'll hand it over to Chief Walker and Chief Jamison to give an update on the actual events that occurred. 
Good morning, Chairman Nowakowski, members of the subcommittee. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and give you an update on our recent deployment. Um, Arizona Task Force One, like the Chief uh, Carpenter said, is one of 28 teams nationally. Um, we are very fortunate to have a team here in Phoenix. It, it's a source of pride for us and brings back a lot of value to us. So we are deployed and activated. Um, we actually go out as a federalized resource under the FEMA mission, and basically that is ur urban search and rescue is our priority. FEMA has many tasks, but our part is that to go out and effect those searches and the rescues um, as quickly as possible. So on the 26th of August, we were deployed for a originally a 14-day deployment to go to Texas in response to Hurricane Harvey. Um, this response is a multi-agency response. It includes multiple task forces. This actually had parts of all 28 teams activated due to the, the um, potential threat that we thought Hur Hurricane Harvey would uh, present to Texas. We also worked with law enforcement from across the country, worked with the Coast Guard, we worked with National Guard resources as well. So it's a very large machine that moves to um, be very proactive and to respond to the needs. And we're wor really working for the needs of the local community, the counties, and the state. That's where our, our missions really come from up through the federal system. So I said Hurricane Harvey was our first assignment. As you remember, that was a Category 4 to 5 hurricane came uh, basically on shore in the Gulf and stayed there for about four to five days, dumping hundreds of inches of rain up to a trillion gallons of water and really resulted in significant flooding to the Houston area and the communities where we worked. Sorry. Oh. Apologize for that. Um, we're on Hurricane Harvey. Oh, there we are. There we are. Um, trillion gallons of water in the community. And because of the large volume of water, the water really didn't absorb. So it would flood one community, and then it would keep migrating to the uh, Gulf and continue to flood other communities. So our first assignment, thank you, um, was actually we arrived there on Sunday night, and we went to work almost immediately this, uh, Monday morning. We were in Katy, Texas. And you can see in the picture these boats on the uh, left side of the slide. This is actually a city street into a community. So water was four, six, eight, ten feet deep. We had people that were <laughs> stuck, um, trapped in their second floor of their homes. And our mission was to go in there and effect rescues. Us and one of the California task forces ac accomplished that mission in uh, about a one-day period. We, our team, rescued 17 people, evacuated 12 others, and several pets. Um, our mission was to get them out of there and then turn them over to local resources to put them into a shelter and take care of them from there. So we were able to accomplish that. As I said, the water continued to migrate south into the community of Wharton. This community was actually isolated from the, really the rest of the world. It has two rivers on each side of it. They were 59 feet above a historical high and isolated them from any type of traffic other than through air operations or through boat or high profile vehicles. And that's what we use. We use boats and we use military vehicles to get in there and again, affect rescues, um, work with California Task Force to evacuate a care center and to search areas to really find out, remove any potential uh, victims or need, people that need to be out of there, but also identify who's still in there so we can leave it over to the local resources to know, here you have people in here. So once we leave, you know who's still in there for you. Um, and so we were able to accomplish that. This work went on for about seven, eight days in the tex Texas area. About the ninth day, it looked like the local resources were going to be able to take over the work and they would not need us. At that point, a decision was made by FEMA to really demobilize our team and most of the other teams. So we started packing up, started heading back home. Um, like I'm sure everybody here and the rest of the world, we were watching Irma to see what was going to happen and the decision was uh, quickly realized that it was going to hit Flor uh, Florida, it was going to hit other areas, and it was going to be a significant hurricane as well. At that point, FEMA being very proactive um, really turned us around and a few other task forces and put us into a forward staging location where we actually were sent into the Orlando Convention Center and rode out Hurricane Irma um, on Saturday. So it blew over us. Um, it was no real damage you know, to our team. Uh, we were in a safe location, but you, it was interesting to hear the wind basically tearing the building apart on the outside um, while we were in there. So we were in a good position once it blew over to really go to work. Um, and the slide here shows Goodland, Florida. So the main area we really did work was in the Marcos Island area. Goodland is a community within the Marcos Island. So Marcos Island is an area that was completely cut off from power, water, um, really no resources for several days. The issue in Florida was not so much flooding, but more structural damage, buildings um, you know, destroyed in one form or another. And so really the community had no idea how many people were trapped. And that was really our assignment is go in there and do wide area searches, find out who's still trapped, who needs to get out, who's going to stay in place, and report that information back. So we affected that operation over a few days in this, um, in this area. Very appreciative. Um, the community was very appreciative of what we did there, and we really were able to meet their needs. And then our final mission, we worked ourselves up into the Arcadia area, where there really was flooding in that um, community. Concern at this point was that as the hurricane moved north, flooding occurred up in the northern part of Florida, and then was migrating south, and we were seeing some flooding. We really assisted that community in a few different ways, really helping them. They were a smaller community, weren't really at all um, 
ready for this type of an emergency or this uh, incident of this scale. So we're able to help bring some, some stabilization, some structure to them, do some wide area searches, but really set them up for success. And that was our final mission, um, you know, for work to be done there. At that point, again, it would look like the local resources were going to be able to take it over, and so they looked to demobilize uh, uh, our team and the rest of the teams. And then finally, before I turn over to Chief Jamison to finish this up, um, basically we were on the road for a 21-day period. We traveled over 3,500 miles um, across the country. We were in eight states. We were in numerous cities. I can't even tell you how many. We slept in rodeo arenas, which is the picture of the big, big blue tarp. We slept in YMCAs. We slept under the stars. And we did have a few hotels. Fortunately, to have a few showers here and there along the way. Um, so it was a, uh, it was a, an amazing trip, mm -hmm. and we appreciate being part of it, being appreciate really taking our team and going there and helping others. And I can tell you they appreciated us being there, and they appreciate when they saw Phoenix, the city of Phoenix, the Phoenix Fire Department, they were really um, amazed we were there and appreciative we were there. So with that, I'll turn over to Chief Jamison. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, good morning. So I would like to tell you a little bit about Arizona Task Force One. Fire Chief Kalkbrenner alluded to the fact that it's one of 28 task forces nationwide, all positioned geographically for optimal response to emergencies that range from natural disasters to man-made. For instance, our first deployment was to Oklahoma City in 1991 after the bombing of the Murrah Building. We are capable, uh, We're the, the team is made of mostly firefighters so this is unique most of the 28 FEMA teams nationwide are professionals that come together from different agencies they train together have certifications in hazardous materials technical rescue command etc but they don't work together every day Phoenix firefighters as you know are a very cohesive team we're well trained we come with tremendous equipment and of course support from the city and our, our subcommittee so in terms of deployment, we're probably one of the best FEMA teams nationwide. And what we saw on this deployment were leaders from FEMA using us more actively than the other 28 teams. Scott mentioned that this was unique and that all 28 teams in some form or another had deployed to Texas and Louisiana. Phoenix took the lead, so Arizona Task Force One was one of the ones that was kept working throughout. And that is a nod to not just our cohesiveness and training, but the support that we see, receive from the federal government. Uh, we're mostly firefighters, but we also have civilians on the team. So again, a, a plus that they were able to incorporate their skills so easily into what we do. We had two physicians who work in an ER. Suddenly they found themselves immersed with 76 firefighters and all that implies. And now I think both of them want to take a test for the Phoenix Fire Department. We have engineers who help us with structural information. So when we approach buildings that have collapsed, are flooded, et cetera, they let us know whether or not it's safe to go in. And most importantly, we have our partners from law enforcement. So we have Phoenix police officers who come with us, not just as safety professionals, but to provide protection if we need it. So as you know, in, in communities where disasters have hit, whether it's man-made or otherwise, everything changes. Scott mentioned there was no power in the community. That means street lights aren't working. So traffic becomes an issue. People have no power in their homes, so they don't have the protection of phones, home phones, refrigerators, etc. So our partners in law enforcement, very critical portion of our FEMA team. Our convoy was probably one of the most dynamic aspects of this deployment. 20 vehicles that moved 3,500 miles through eight states over 21 days. So imagine going on a road trip with your family, how much work that is. 80 of us in these 20 vehicles and of all sizes. So we had vans, F-350s pulling trailers with boats, box trucks filled with equipment uh, necessary to affect any type of rescue from confined space, high angle, hazardous materials, technical rescue, in addition to keeping us sustainable for 72 hours. So we also carry meals ready to eat, cots, sleeping bags, et cetera. So an incredibly robust team and well prepared to deploy. And we can do so, by the way, within eight hours of being informed that we have a deployment. So just an incredible team backing us up, mechanics on board with their tools, a communication truck, to boost our radio signals, et cetera. Very valuable. This is an idea of what our cache looks like. So you see the gentleman looking in the back of the box truck. All of those have to be labels. Labeled, put in a schematic for the logistics guys to know what box to go to and when. 
batteries, radios, rain gear, all of this was packed within there, uh, so critical that they were able to access that quickly. And again, a nod to our professionalism and training and support that they did so well. Safety was a huge factor. I mentioned the over the road. That was probably the most dangerous thing we did. So as firefighters, we deploy effect rescues as we talked about hazardous materials, et cetera, every day. We work together, we know the language, uh, we understand how to protect one another. We have procedures that keep us safe, just like law enforcement. But the over the road was probably the most dynamic. In addition to the physical safety, there was the emotional aspect. So we were very careful about keeping the firefighters communicating, not just with us, letting them know what was going on. And it's a dynamic scene, it changes quickly but also with their families. So we had a family component in place as well. Every day the families received updates from a home team. All of you received updates from our executive staff. That was critical that we let everyone know what was going on and it kept our members on the road feeling safer, safer and of course their wives and families at home feeling safe as well. So that again was extremely um, successful and we were very proud of the way that was affected. Finally, Scott mentioned this as well, Assistant Chief Walker. I cannot emphasize the amount of goodwill that this built with local media and media nationally. So we were actually mentioned by the fire chief on Marcos Island in Florida, specifically on CNN. He said, we want to thank the Phoenix Fire Department and Arizona Task Force One for coming to our rescue. So the back of our blue shirt say Task Force One, but they say Phoenix as well. So we've positioned ourselves as a national leader who can step forth and help other agencies, other communities, support them, not take over, and then bring that training back here and also the goodwill that it provides to us. Finally, we talked about funding briefly. This is fully cost recoverable. In addition, it benefits us daily because the equipment that we receive from FEMA, whether it's shoring, high angle rescue, confined space, hazardous materials, all of the things that we brought to this deployment, we use daily in Phoenix and we train on it weekly. So this is something that doesn't sit in a warehouse gathering dust until the deployment occurs. It is an ongoing robust system that allows us to enjoy this equipment, utilize it for the citizens as well, and again, provided by the federal government. So that's valuable too. So in closing, we'd just like to say really thank you to all of you, the rest of the council, the mayor, city leadership, and our fire chief for allowing us this opportunity to go and do this. And as I said, it was appreciated by those communities that we served and we helped every day. Thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? I'd like to make comments. Mm -hmm. I will tell you, we are so proud of you. I, just watching this, but watching uh, on CNN or Fox or some of those other stations, you appeared periodically. And what you faced there, I mean, I, the trauma alone, the emotional experience, um, but you are the best. You are the pros. And I can't think of anyone who makes me prouder uh, when you're out there, you're Phoenix, and you represent this community so well, and we thank you very much from all the citizens in Phoenix and the council members. Any other comments? As you probably know, we've been hearing from folks you touched in along the way who've written in and said thank you so much for what the Phoenix team has done for us, and it's been wonderful to, to hear it from those folks. It really felt that you made you were there when they had no one else and made such a big difference. So thank you. Would you talk a little bit about how you think this might this experience might leave us well prepared? Should we have a significant large scale event in the Phoenix area? So that really is one of the um, benefits of being having a task force and doing these deployments. So fortunately, we hopefully we'll never have an incident, a large scale incident, but we know the reality is it's possible. So by going and operating that system in a large scale system with local and county and state agencies and EOCs and understanding how that process works, being able to go out there and exercise our tools and our equipment and, and working in that structure and that environment, that directly relates to our ability to function here every day. We are very good at what we do and we can handle a lot in the city of Phoenix, but as, a, as an incident, much like we saw recently in Vegas happens, that's a large scale incident. Going and doing these deployments and the skills we learn there can directly relate to back to what we do every day and make us better prepared for those type of incidents.
Were there any lessons learned that you think the public safety subcommittee should know? Was there equipment you wish you'd had that you didn't, or things that came out in the after action review that we ought to pay attention to? So we're actually finalizing, I'm sorry, uh, that, Council the question, Gago, um, we are finalizing our, um, our after action report now. So we have each sections, each of the disciplines looking at uh, those, those exact questions and see we'll have that. At this time, um, I, I don't believe anything has come up that we know this is a, a glaring gap that we have for our community. Um, but if we identify those, we'll certainly bring those forward to you. Wonderful. Appreciate that. Thank you so much for your service. It was wonderful to watch what you were doing and feel Phoenix was a part of a national response to a very rough couple weeks. So thank you. Vice Mayor. I, out of curiosity, how are you, how does FEMA choose or how do they determine what groups go where? Because we're having right now a lot of natural <laughs> disasters all over the country. And uh, I just would watch how you would move then to the next one and then to the next one. And so you ended up in Florida. And the reason why, I'm, as you were talking, I was thinking, I was like, okay, we have a system, a large system, able to, to help and rescue uh, when we're in crisis. I think uh, we're in crisis in Puerto Rico. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you guys could have been ready, centered, ready to go and moved over to Puerto Rico to get into some of those um, mountains in the mountains in the areas that they still can't get to, uh, that they have to helicopter people in. Um, and so I'm thinking about that, and then I'm thinking about Vegas, and now I'm thinking about California, and I'm like, whoa, we have a lot moving right now, and, and, and how is it determined then we're going to tap you to go to this one. So that, well, that is my curiosity. So that's a very good question, Vice Mayor Pastora, and I can answer that. FEMA has a response model, so teams are pushed forward, uh, rotated throughout the year. We literally were set to respond number one in September, although the deployment happened in August. Again, we talked about the geographic positioning of the team. So if something occurred, whether you're first or not, the closest team will go. In a case like this, uh, Puerto Rico, for instance, by the time that was occurring, we had had 21 days on the road. A typical deployment is 14 days. When we talked about the robustness, 16, 18, 20 hour days, all of the moving parts, a team times out at a certain point, and, and then they rotate. There's also different sizes of teams. So we were a type one on this particular de deployment, 80 people. FEMA can also parse that out to a type two or a type three. They're smaller, they're specialty teams. So for instance, FEMA has a component that would be an incident command component. It's called an incident support team. They sent one of those to Puerto Rico. In fact, one of our members, Deputy Chief Frank Solomon, responded to that as a public information officer. Those guys go in and just as we talked about, support the locals. They don't take over, but they offer these skills in times of crisis and chaos to help them organize. And, and we continue to do that. And one more point, recently we sent our member services wellness team to Las Vegas after the shooting to provide a member wellness component to stand by and say, what counseling do you need? What can we provide to the community to help make it whole again? So it's great to hear that we're all over the place and that we're doing goodwill. And I really appreciate all the work that you do because it's not just you, it's a larger uh, family that comes in that engages with uh, public safety, obviously uh, engineers, but it takes a whole group of experts and also understanding of the situation they're in and also uh, mental wellness to be in those situations. So thank you very much for doing that. Well, thank you, Chief, for being good ambassadors of the city of Phoenix and helping our neighbors in times of need. Thank you. We're on item number six, Phoenix Cares program. Mr. Chair, as Mo's coming up, uh, this means you can't leave. So we have yes. a motion. We have a motion that Mo cannot retire. Is there, a, is there a second to that motion? Second. All right. Um, discussion over that. <laughs> um, motion uh, to approve. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, um, uh, Chairman Nowakowski, member of the subcommittee, thank you so much for the opportunity 
to, uh, uh, to talk to you about citywide homeless encampment response for the city. Thank you. Um, to my right, uh, we have uh, uh, the Director of the Neighborhood Services Department, Chris Hallett, Commander Anthony Vasquez. Uh, we have Assistant City Prosecutor Patricia George and uh, Assistant Chief uh, Harry Markley. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity. I do want to say this is just a tip of the Phoenix team. All departments are involved in many of the aspects we're going to talk to you about this morning, but as well as many others, uh, streets, public works, parks, library, transit, housing. They're all part of many of the discussions we're going to have with you. Uh, first, uh, our approach uh, that we're going to talk to you about is really to be comprehensive, multidisciplinary, coordinated, innovative. We need to be leveraging and partnering. The city of Phoenix is only one component of a large uh, county uh, that really has to step up with this issue uh, that is really uh, being seen across the nation. Uh, the data I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment is something that is being experienced everywhere. Uh, if you look at articles, just Google articles, you will see everything from uh, LA to, to Seattle, uh, from Portland to San Diego, uh, Los Angeles, uh, New York. Uh, we are experiencing across this nation an increase in unsheltered homeless uh, on the street. Uh, here in the city of Phoenix, I'll show you the data in just a moment, across five years, uh, we've had an increase uh, it, over the last two years of greater than 50%, actually approaching 59%. And the majority of the individuals, because we are the largest uh, uh, city in the county, the majority of the individuals that are counted are, in fact, in the city of Phoenix. Uh, we are part of the continuum of care in our region, and uh, with that HUD funding uh, comes the uh, responsibility of counting homeless. Uh, during the last one day during the last 10 days of January. This is done across the nation. Uh, so with that coordinated effort, we count homeless, sheltered and unsheltered. This data is only about those that are unsheltered. So this is across the five, last five years. And you can see easily that the number of unsheltered individuals uh, has been growing steadily for the last four years. These secondary numbers that are uh, showing now are the number of individuals that are in the city of Phoenix of the larger number. So example, in 2017, of uh, the little over 2,000 individuals that were counted that were unsheltered, uh, 1,500 of them approximately were in the city of Phoenix. So clearly, everything that you are seeing, that our residents are seeing and experiencing is very real. Uh, this data just bears it out. Uh, I do want to take a moment and to say thank you, Mayor, council uh, members uh, for uh, the great support that you have always given uh, the city uh, city management in terms of uh, dealing with uh, homeless issues. Uh, we certainly do our part. We know that uh, everyone needs to do their part. Everyone needs to do more if they can. Uh, we certainly are so proud of what we do. Uh, we spend over $4.2 million in homeless uh, directly in funding. Uh, the largest share of that, about 50% of that, is an emergency shelter. We are one of the funders of Central Arizona Shelter Services, the largest uh, shelter uh, in the state of Arizona. We also uh, fund uh, UMOM New Day Center uh, for families, uh, also the Halley Day Center through UMOM for single women. Uh, so we do a lot in this area. We also, though, have uh, funding that we put to wraparound services and rapid rehousing models. And we also help with move-in deposits. When an individual that is homeless, even when they find a voucher or they have the opportunity to move in, there are deposits that have to be paid. And we help in that regard as well. And then the most recent thing that we have uh, really gotten very much uh, directly involved in is outreach and engagement. Uh, two budget cycles ago, uh, you uh, subcommittee and the mayor and the rest of the council approved a $100,000 for veteran navigation as an example. Uh, Mesa has put in another 20000 to that and we've uh, been doing navigation with veterans specifically. Uh, this last budget cycle, the Human Services Department uh, redirected uh, as many resources as it could to put to a outreach and engagement contract that I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment. So we do a lot of this. But the direct uh, dollars is not the only thing that we do. Our housing department is extremely uh, supportive and reactive 
uh, and proactive with regards to helping us with vouchers for vulnerable populations. Uh, these are just some of the examples. We have over 900 uh, veteran vouchers, they're called bash vouchers, out in the community being used. Over 300 for chronically uh, homeless individuals. I'll talk about more in just a moment. Over 50 for families and over 30 for youth. Um, but we also, uh, this is what we do directly. We also leverage and partner uh, in, in a, many, many ways. I do want to talk to you about one, and that's uh, we are part of the largest re, uh, rapid rehousing project in the state of Arizona, uh, $3.5 million that I'll explain how we got to in just a moment. And between our chronic uh, vouchers of uh, 275 that you allocated, coupled with this project, uh, we have housed, near, now it's nearly 800 individuals over the last 18 months with new uh, sources of uh, funding and projects. Uh, and what that is, is every single Monday morning at 9 o'clock, every single Monday morning at 9 o'clock, the Valley of Sun United Way, the City of Phoenix, the Arizona Department of Housing, Maricopa County uh, Human Services Department, and the Department of Economic Security, along with myself uh, and uh, Commander Brad Burt, sit and talk about what we can do, what are we doing, what more can we do about the issue of homelessness. It is through this collaborative that we came to the rapid rehousing model. The Valley of Sun United Way, with all of the partners behind them, made application to the City of Phoenix and the Maricopa County Industrial Development Authority. Uh, they received a million dollars from those two entities, put in another half a million dollars of philanthropy funds, and with that first $2.5 million, we started to house what we believe would be up to 250 individuals. As we approached that 250, the Arizona Department of Housing felt that this was a great project and they put another million dollars into the project. So that is how we got to the three and a half million dollars. Now you, uh, I showed the vouchers uh, that this, the housing department has, has allotted to us for this purpose and they've done so through your uh, uh, approval. And so when you approve 275 vouchers as an example for a uh, chronically homeless individuals, you said, here it is, we were so thankful, but you said, we know what it takes to house chronically homeless individuals and to keep them housed. And you said, you want us to use them only when we have the wraparound services. So the final uh, collaborative or partnership I want to uh, briefly touch upon is at Mercy Maricopa Integrated Care, the regional behavioral health authority for our region, uh, takes their uh, Medicaid funding uh, uh, for case management and services, and they use that Medicaid funding uh, to uh, wrap around the services for the use of the City of Phoenix 275 vouchers. Well, That's the Vice how, Mayor has a question yes. for you. Yes. I have a question in this collaborative leverage. Did I hear correctly? It's $3.5 million? $3.5 million as, is as, the rapid rehousing project that was was funded through what I just described with the Phoenix Industrial Development Authority money. Okay. Reason why I'm asking is because uh, I'm looking at this slide and it says 4.2 million and then 3.5 million okay. in rapid rehousing and then you're talking about this. So it's okay. it's the same? No. The 4.2 million dollars is the city of Phoenix only dollars that go into okay. homelessness in those categories I described. The 3.5 million is this rapid rehousing project that came about because of this collaborative. Okay. And, and that, that $3.5 million is a million dollars of the Maricopa County and City of Phoenix Industrial Development Authority, 500000 from the Valley of Sun United Way, and another million dollars from the Arizona Department of Housing. Okay. So collectively, we're putting $7.7 .7 million into this whole uh, piece. Between the City of Phoenix funding of 4.2 and the collaborative that we're in, yes, those two add up to that amount. Okay, only because I, then I was going to add the other 3.5, and that's when I realized we're, we're using the same numbers. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how much money we are investing in this community and uh, so, how this is operating. So. Okay. So, Madam Chair, just to be clear, th this is just the City of Phoenix and this collaborative. There are many other dollars that go into housing. The continuum of care is $26 million that fund other projects as well. But I'm just, yeah. Yes. In this program, I'm trying to figure out how much money has been invested. Okay. That's why. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, um, as you can see, our strategy is we, we're trying to lead with services. The only thing that really solves homelessness is, of course, a place to live. So our first goal is to permanently get people off the streets, lead with services, but we are being overwhelmed uh, with calls uh, from residents, from businesses. You get calls, your offices get calls. We get calls into 911, calls into uh, uh, Crime Stop, et cetera. And those calls coming in all different places is not allowing us to be as collaborative as we can to get together and know where we're going to go jointly. We many times find ourselves going to the same place because the calls are coming in from different places. That is what has brought us to what we are calling our community action response engagement services, uh, coordinated city response, Phoenix Cares. Um, what this is is one phone number uh, for residents to call in to report encampments so that we can log them and know where they are, how many people are calling about them, so that we can then send out the resources in a co coordinated fashion. We would lead with services, and so that's the first thing that we will do. And before I get into exactly how we use the outreach team and all of that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Chris Hallett to talk about uh, Phoenix Cares more in general. Yes, thanks, Mo. Uh, as Mo mentioned, this is a collaborative effort that was put together after we all found all the stakeholders are actually dealing with the homeless on a regular basis. We're finding out it's taking a larger percentage of our time and we're doing it uh, separate from each other. We're not doing it consistently. We're not reporting back to each other or coordinating. Uh, as we found out how much it's really touching each of our operations, we thought better we get together and have a collaborative approach uh, that can be a consistent way that we actively respond with engagement and services uh, to better um, handle encampments in particular, but the homeless in general. So as you see here, this is a basic high-level overview. We have a much more detailed uh, flow chart that goes cross-departmental uh, on how we communicate. But this is a new way of having all the calls, instead of coming each of your offices, each of our departments, have it all come into one phone number, one point of contact, uh, on a number that will be released later this month. Uh, we're testing it right now, it's in development, and you know, we're gonna make sure it's a seamless way for these calls to enter into the system. We're also developing a new uh, application to the Phoenix at your service, so as an entry point. Those will be our two main entry points for complainants to come in on encampments uh, or homeless. Our call center then will triage these calls as they come in <coughs> and be able to collect the data by location and dispatch the necessary services. Now, predominantly, if it has homeless individuals involved in the location, they're gonna engage the outreach team. Mo's gonna talk a little bit more about uh, the new outreach teams that we have in place to be able to lead with those services that we talked about. Uh, they will be dispatched, go out there, and take the actions necessary. If they're able to take them to services, they will. If not, they may be handing um, it over if the, the occupants of the encampment aren't following rules or regulations or not a law abiding, uh, following ETAs or other things that could be handed over to our repeat offender program where they can start building a case to help motivate the individuals to clear the camp. Once either the, the human service outreach team or the police clear the camp, then neighborhood services comes in. If it's a private property owner, we work collaboratively with the police department to get an authority to arrest for the property and to post it appropriately with no trespass so they can aid in uh, the, the uh, rope of program uh, case management for that, as well as getting the property cleaned up through the homeowner. If it's in the public right of way, we're gonna work with our partner departments and public works. If it's in an alley with the streets departments and an easement or retention area, uh, and the parks departments in a park, library, et cetera. Uh, we, this um, is gonna be cyclical. We're gonna have repeats on these areas. These are not uh, one stop will be done. It takes a lot of touches as Mo's gonna get into as he gets into the engagement. Uh, we've been doing this through some internal training. There's gonna be a lot of training on all departments. Uh, the assistant city manager pulled this all together in August to make sure everybody in the city knows what's doing. As a result, we've been funneling all the calls since March through an internal program to be able to, and we're getting about 100 calls per month coming through our system where we've been able to have some success dealing with these encampments. Again, leading with uh, services, I'm going to hand it back over to Mo to go over the engagement activities. Uh, thank you, Chris. Can I ask a quick question? Go ahead. Um, when you talk about encampments, how many homeless people does it take to make an encampment? Mr. Chair, Councilwoman Williams, it's, it, encampment's more about the structures, not so much the people. We're going to get a lot of calls where it's just people congregating somewhere, but if it's leaving trash, debris, structures, 
cardboard boxes, shopping carts, et cetera, that's, that's where our trio is going to elicit information about, are we talking about just people? Are there artifacts there, structures that need to be dealt with? So it's going to be a mixture of those things, but encampments in particular are things that are going to be left behind when the people leave. Because I, I, I have so many calls on uh, Bell Road, all across Bell Road, the needles. But it's, <clears throat> it's individuals. Uh, how would you address something like that? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Williams, I'm sorry. Um, th that's so difficult to question. Uh, the reason we say encampments is it's a group of individuals that are staying there in one particular area for some duration of time, and that usually then ensues a structure of some sort. That's a encampment. Uh, it is not uh, illegal or against the law to be homeless. So an individual that's homeless that is not doing anything illegal is a homeless individual that's just on our streets. And so what this is set up to do is to deal with the encampments, with structures, with, with debris, uh, with individuals congregating one place. We can get out to them and services. We know if they're in encampment, they're going to be there either uh, going there in the evening to, to bed down or they're going to be there before we, they leave so we can get at them. One call about one individual or a few individuals in one place, by the time we even got out there, the chances are they're gone. So it is a very difficult thing, but this is why this is about encampments. It's something that is there. We can get them. We can engage with them uh, and, and hopefully bring them to services. So, Vice Mayor. So I look at how you're defining encampment as if uh, they have been there more than several days and that is basically where they're living. I mean, that's what I would consider encampment by, by the explanation that was just given. Yeah, that's very similar, I believe, to what I just said. Uh, yeah, I just, it, okay. it's, it's yes. kind of like they're living there, they've been at that spot for four or five days, they're not moving, they're now expanding their space yeah. and, and, and possibly more individuals could be part of that. I have a question about um, people conjugating or coming together and just standing around. There was at one point, and this is in my mind in history because I'm a teacher, there was at one point where students, if three or four students were hanging out together, that could be considered uh, gang activity, or it could be uh, considered uh, them loitering around an area, and there could be some questioning that could happen. That's around the malls and right, after right, hours, right? Right, mm -hmm. around the malls everywhere. Um, and so when there are three or four Transients, I guess I'll use the term. Um, what is that considered? Um, so, Vice Mayor, an encampment, let me try to clarify, it's a location where people are gathering in makeshift um, uh, dwellings, places that they're habitually uh, returning and using for, um, if you want to call hanging out or, or dwelling. So, it can be a, a different variety, whether it's tents, cardboard, whatever they use. But when all their properties are around, that really um, shows us that's an encampment area. OK. But with the, could you give me, kind of explain to me when three or four people are hanging out together? Uh, because that there was a certain point where uh, it was a time in our community where four minority boys were hanging out together. and. Uh, they, a call would go in or somebody would suspicious, suspiciousness, and it would be, uh, well, we asked if they were gang related or whatever. You know, you know where I'm going. Sure. <clears throat> so, and I know how our previous contacts were. The police department will go and respond to any location a citizen wants to call and has a concern. We'll make contact with them to determine what activity they are doing. There are some locations that we cannot take any type of enforcement action, but we can't ask people, we're receiving calls, we need you to move along. We do get cooperation uh, from the, uh, the majority of people, um, so that's one way for us to handle it. But just for them congregating in a location, we can't specifically enforce anything on that, unless there's an authority to arrest or an owner of a property 
has asked them to leave. Or they're drinking out in public. Oh, well, there's another one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And if I could just clarify, it doesn't have to be several days. An encampment can be the very first night. If they're bedding down and they have their personal property there, we'll take the call then. We don't have to wait any number of days. As Mo mentioned, that's the encampment. That's where our outreach team are going to find them at night or early in the morning. That's where they're staying the night, and then they're off mobile during the day. Best order of success on engaging them. So uh, as we indicated, uh, the Human Services Department uh, did redirect uh, resources to create uh, a request for proposal, which we put out. Uh, the uh, effective 7-1 community bridges uh, was awarded that contract uh, through a competitive process. Uh, they began hiring and training their staff. They're trained or, their staff are, are trained, certified peer specialists with uh, trained in de-escalation techniques, motivational interviewing, cultural competency, health and safety, including blood borth pathogen, CPR, and first aid. So they're highly trained. Uh, our contract was able to uh, fund uh, four teams of two. Those four teams allow us to have at least one team available uh, seven days a week from 5 a.m. in the morning till 11 p.m. at night. Um, uh, they will have transportation. This is a direct service uh, contact. So if somebody engages and they say they will go to uh, emergency shelter, they will be taken there. If they say they will go to the uh, detox, they will be taken there. Uh, it is a service that in that transportation we have the ability to not just hand off or give a card or make a referral, but literally take people to services. Um, they do have uh, access to the vast behavioral health system of uh, community bridges as well as other entities. They are, community bridges is not the only uh, behavioral health uh, entity, so they have access to all of that. Uh, since the, uh, now when they do engage with individuals, uh, the, the phone system calling in is the where, and when uh, the outreach team goes out, that's the who. And what we're going to be doing with the individuals is we're going to be immediately checking the homeless management information system to see if they're already engaged with some homeless provider. So if they are engaged with a provider, that is information is going to be in HMIS. Well, they will be able to know that. They'll be able to reconnect them with that program or get them back on those services. If they're not, then they will put them into the system. So now they're in there and we'll know who we're touching and eventually where we touch them because there is a GPS component of HMIS that we hope to be able to use as time goes on. Uh, so that's the how. That's how we will track the who uh, uh, that we are engaging in. Now, uh, we, since 7-1, uh, CBI, uh, CBI specialists have engaged over 350 individuals. About 49% of them we're calling engaged. What engaged means does not mean we solved anything. It means that they have interacted with us, given us their name, given us information, are willing to talk to us. So about 49% are, are in that kind of a category. And then, um, uh, w then we also can get them enrolled. So enrolled means that they are already in a program, we get them reconnected, that we re-enroll them, get them back into services, or there may be a brand new thing that we're doing to get them into services that day. And uh, of that 350, about 170 have been engaged and about 128 have actually been enrolled. And again, though, I must say, and, and be clear that that doesn't mean that we solved it. We have been solving things. We have taken people to shelter. We have permanently housed uh, a half a dozen or so. We have reconnected veterans with the veteran system. We have taken individuals to mental health services. We have taken individuals to the hospital because of a medical emergency that was occurring at the time. So we are solving things. But this process from engagement to housing is a road that is not a straight line. It takes many touches. It takes going out. Uh, we'll go out as many times. But to be quite honest with you, many people will not be engaged, do not want to go to services. Now, as long as they are not doing anything illegal or anything's going on, all we can do is try to re-engage them. However, if there is activity that's going on, if there's this repeat uh, a pattern that's going on, we can make a referral, and we do make referrals to the repeat offender program, and that's where uh, the police department and Commander Vasco was talking about just a moment uh, to talk about how uh, that process works and how it goes back and forth. Commander? Thank you. <clears throat> so the police department's primary responsibility is still going to be responding to in-progress crimes. Um, our participation in Phoenix Cares doesn't alter any of that. 
what we found in the past is that officers were going out arresting individuals, homeless individuals, for minor criminal offenses. What we discovered is we couldn't just arrest our way out of the issue. So subjects were being released from jail almost with time served or very little jail time without getting to services. So this means that the people were still suffering from substance, alcohol, and uh, abuse, and mental illness. So Phoenix CARES actually allows us a coordinated response um, with all the city departments. And what it really allows is the police department to try and initially go to services with these individuals before we get to the criminal component. So it also allows us to uh, collectively evaluate um, encampment locations and direct the appropriate services to them. So what the department has also done is we've uh, dedicated one squad, and I'll call it our, um, uh, our MROP program, um, just for simplicity so everybody's on the same page. But we have one dedicated sergeant, 10 detectives, and we have one to two officers in each one of the precincts. Being out in the precincts was important to us. Um, we wanted the detectives to have that interaction with the beat officers and also our community action officers. Our CAOs are the backbone of our interaction with the community. We had to have the detectives in touch with them so they would get the input from the neighborhood associations and the community groups so they would find out what's actually affecting them in their neighborhoods. Um, so our detectives, their goal is to have a systematic and a consistent response to the different issues uh, related to our unsheltered individuals and our encampments throughout the city. So we're going to target the criminal element who is actually concealing themselves inside the homeless population. Some of them are going to be homeless or unsheltered individuals that are involved, but we have other ones that are um, going over and using that population for drug sales and other things like that. So we want them uh, to target those individuals. So our MRO program, what we're looking for is targeting the habitual criminal offender. So we want to try and get people to services first. That's one of the big things with us. But for the ones that um, we can't get to services, we want to utilize travel restrictions, uh, enhanced sentencing, and diversion. Uh, through the city prosecutor's office when appropriate. So this structure allows us to target the most disruptive individuals and provide services uh, to the other individuals who we can hopefully deter from staying out and being homeless. So the, sorry, the next steps, while we're doing training internally with all the departments and their staff, so they're fully aware of the program and its outreach as well as getting the single point of contact phone number ready and its form. We're going to be scheduling and I already have a couple meetings scheduled out in the greater communities uh, with several of the districts. We're going to go to all the districts to see if they have any hot spots in which we can have a community meeting uh, where we can collect their priorities and, and their engagement around this. This program, again, is a compilation of working together with a lot of our stakeholders. We want the input from our community on how we can tweak this. Uh, we're already collecting some data. We're going to obviously have benchmarks going in so we can measure our successes. We're going to want to hear from the community what they're seeing and how it measures up with the statistics we're getting. So we we'll also want to know each of their respective areas, the hot spots. You, know, you know that Bell Road or somebody has a wash or area where they're collecting. We want to be able to know what those are, how they can have and call it in, and how we can engage them in this process. As Mo said earlier, everybody touched by homelessness has a role in solving this, and we're going to need everybody's help as we go through this. But we do believe we've already had some successes, and we look forward to having many more, uh, and then starting with community outreach. Councilmember Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you and I talked about uh, a certain park, Cortez Park. <laughs> yes. And uh, and you said you were going out to the precincts because I think I relayed to you that some of the officers said, well, we kick them out today. Uh, they're wise enough. They've gone through the system enough that they know how long they have to stay away. And then they return. I mean, you, <clears throat> when you talk about encampment, it's not like they're a group. They're sleeping on all the tables. Uh, and they're there constantly. And the Parks Department, I hope, is part of this. And you're training their rangers uh, because now they're trying to move these people along. Uh, 
and you talked about keeping statistics. Are you going to inform us uh, the numbers that are called in and the areas, preferably by district, would be uh, nice to know uh, so that we can monitor the situation and respond to our community members who are, this is the hottest topic there is, homeless and roads. That's all people care about right now because that's the biggest crisis we're facing. So uh, I guess I'll listen to hear what you say and how often you're going to give us the information. Yes, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, that's a very valid question. Uh, this is a hotspot map we've already gathered just since March on where the encampments have been come through this process so far. We look, we look to do a 90-day look back on where, they're, where the hotspots are happening, and we hope to see a transition over time and they're not staying in the same spots. We hope to quash these, but you know we're going to monitor that. We can do that. Obviously, it's geography. We can provide each council district uh, any kind of reporting they would like to see within their district. But that is one of the areas that we are looking at to see where are these common areas. We want to make sure we get out to the communities that are most impacted by that uh, and by the calls. And those are areas that are in the red that have been reported? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Those are the ones since March that have already come through. Uh, it's right now everything's kind of coming through the Neighborhood Services Call Center, which is ultimately who's going to continue to take those calls. But internally, this is what we've been doing since March, testing out the program. Do the police report this to you also? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, yes. This, we share this information across all these departments. It includes public works, parks, library, uh, working with the fire department when they have a homeless person that they're providing services to instead of just releasing them. They're going to have access to this database that says this person is known or wanted for services or for an MROPE. So we share this information. This is the geography information that's being kept. They keep their respective people information due to privacy and other matters for HMIS as well as in the police departments. But we share it at the element of the encampment level. Thank you. Any other questions? I have several questions. Um, what is the number for uh, that we're sharing for service, for service or where I can call? Because this weekend I didn't have a number and I was calling, texting, and calling everybody. So, what is the number that uh, neighborhoods or neighbors can call? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the subcommittee, not related to this program. Anybody can call the neighborhood services right now at 602-534-4444 for any neighborhood related So if I issues. want to call specifically about encampment. Yes, you could call that number. This is the number that we'll be use, we're, we're releasing out? That's, no, it's not the number we're releasing out. Okay. That number's not ready to accept these calls yet. It's otherwise being used and it would not be a seamless transition at this point. It's being tested and being geared up through programming. Okay. But it will ultimately end up with the same people who are taking the calls today at Neighborhood Services. Okay. Um, this weekend, I was all over the place, specifically Sunday, all over everybody's district. And uh, I encountered a DV homeless um, situation where um, I dealt with DPS uh, cops. Um, because I was in the capital area. Uh, and so my question is, how are we coordinating, because I had a great conversation with DPS, uh, how are we coordinating also with DPS and all that area? Because there's a high population of transients and there's encampment, and I had took pictures. I have plenty of pictures of that area. And, uh, uh, when we, when the, the DPS officer and I were having conversations, they um, monitor, they make sure between 19th Avenue, I know I'd say 15th Avenue where all the state buildings are, they make sure and they kind of manage that area, I guess, in a way, and uh, uh, also helps Phoenix police. So my question is, how are we communicating with our other partners on all these pieces? Um, the second thing is um, there's tons of encampment on 15th, starting, no, actually starting probably from 7th Avenue all the way to 19th Avenue. 
and it's just encampments. Um, and I, the state capital area, right? <clears throat> no, right there on Van Buren, all on University Park. The other piece is I went to University Park, Townsend, Monterey, and Encanto that afternoon. And tons of activity happening in there, some encampment. Uh, what I'm noticing in our parks is that our families are not coming out now. And our families are not using the parks the way they used to at the capacity. So how are we going to, I guess in the group, Phoenix Cares, handle that piece? Um, I know that they're, and I will repeat what is told to me, and total get an understanding that uh, they're individuals, as long as the park is open from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., they're more than welcome to be part of the park. I'm not um, discriminating in that. What I'm saying is, is now families don't want to participate. And uh, the park is open to everybody. Um, and so I think that's a bigger, larger conversation we have. Uh, the other dynamic in this piece is my, uh, all our neighborhoods are being affected by it. And how do we counsel our neighborhoods? Uh, because there's a human side to this. And there's a, a total uh, compassion side to it. But if it's repeated and repeated, then there becomes another side where the compassion is lost. And it becomes more of an aggression and an anger within the neighborhood. And so I think we have to, I don't know how we solve this problem, but I'm, I'm glad that we're trying to solve the issue. Uh, but I think we're in for a big, it's gonna take, we're already in $7.7 .7 million. I don't know how much more money it's gonna take uh, to solve this problem. Um, but those are just some of my thoughts. Uh, I have tons of questions, but I would prefer to have another meeting on Phoenix Cares and uh, be able to then uh, get the questions to my colleagues to look at in advance so then, then we can have a dialogue uh, about all of this because uh, it's bigger than what we think. And then my last one is, who's responsible at the end of this whole Phoenix Cares? Who has responsibility of this program? And seeing the continuum with, uh, with that um, client or customer and making sure that we close the, the gap. Um, how does a, a, a file get closed or how does it continue? And then who will hold responsibility of this? Over our, Mr. Chairman, Vice Mayor, members of the subcommittee, overarching, we are, all, we are all responsible. We meet every week. We are talking about what's going on in, with the calls and all those kinds of things. So overall, however, on an individual basis, as an example, when uh, the contractor CBI goes out and engages an individual, they will keep trying to contact, if they don't go to services right away, keep contacting them and trying to get them into services. So until we get them into something, it won't be closed. But even then, I will say to you that we have transported people, numerous examples, transporting people to services, and then they're right back out two days later, one day later. So it is just, it, it is really a cycle that we have to keep at and keep at overall. Uh, to some of your other things that you mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, parks has added park rangers that that will be helpful and we are training all of our department staff in in all of these things uh, but just as you heard in other presentations earlier today as I was sitting about the square miles of the city of Phoenix and the resources it takes to cover it we're going to have that same issue uh, with these resources at all as well but as we really have the one number it's operational and the data is coming in we are going to be learning a lot as an example do we really need a Saturday coverage, a Sunday coverage. Do you know? Are the hours the right hours? Do we have? Should we start at five o'clock? We just don't know until we gather information and we can do some analysis. And we're really, really on the brink of barely on the beginning of this whole, the, the entire Phoenix Care opportunity. So, Mo, I've been 
actively engaged very silently in the community on this. And so I'm going to give you an example that I have been working on all summer. Um, it's an encampment. Uh, it started May, was there throughout the whole process, even as of Sunday. Um, didn't have a number to call, so I just called to those that I know who to call to help me with this. Um, woman was touched nine times, normally seven, nine times. Uh, police worked with the landowner, the land uh, developer or person uh, regarding uh, trespassing, regarding all these other pieces to make sure that everything was set up. Um, didn't budge, didn't move. Um, as of this weekend, uh, they, someone spent a good quality amount of time, I would say like over an hour, uh, and it, they've been spending a lot of time with her, but uh, over an hour saying, uh, this is the last time we'll be out here. Uh, next time there's trespassing signs, next time you will be arrested. Um, she opted to be arrested. Um, so I guess my question is, she took some of her, the items, because there was an encampment, so she took some of the items. Uh, the rest of the stuff has been left there. Um, the question is then, at that point, when does that get picked up? Because she may be out of, the, um, out of doing her time, or, or how, and her stuff still may be there, and she may start all over. So how quickly do we get out to get the stuff to start moving? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Madam uh, uh, Vice Mayor, it's as soon as possible we can get it. It's a matter of coordinating efforts. I, I believe she was arrested yesterday morning as a result of all the interactions over the weekend. Uh, that gets moved in the process to, that was private property because you mentioned an authority to arrest. So we have to work with the private property owner to clean it up. We can get a lot faster when it's city owned property, right away parks, easement. When it's a private property owner, we can't go onto their private property to clean it up. We have to have them do it. We have to go through the due process of that through enforcement, notification, et cetera. Mr. Chairman, yes. um, this is also an area where we've had extensive communication within the law department because um, even though it's distasteful to touch and you don't always know what you're dealing with, uh, we don't have the legal authority to just summarily dis discard people's, it's their property. So the arrest is made, the items are there. Uh, sometimes we have a responsibility to try to capture the property for the person and that creates a lot of issues. So we're, we're trying to work through all of that. And to the vice mayor's earlier point, and as this gets up and running, uh, one of the areas where we could use additional support because we know you communicate to your constituents in newsletters, et cetera, is this is the approach that the city is trying to go to, a coordinated approach. We get a lot of calls historically uh, to your point about the anger where people want the city response to the encampment to be a police action. We'll just send the police out there and clear them out. I don't want. I don't want to see that. I got a child, and sometimes the precinct commander is trying to be responsive to their areas. It was solely a police action. Uh, while we understand that, we believe this is a better way where we're all coordinated together. It's just going to take us a while to perfect this, uh, but it, it's much better to be comprehensive and solely view it as law enforcement but all of their property is an issue on how fast and what to do with it. You know, I have one card. Can we have uh, Ms. Summers come up and... Oh, there's two. Sorry, I just put my little down. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh -oh, no. I know why I'm not a <laughs> There we go. 
Thank you. Good morning. I'm here this morning because I'm disappointed. Uh, the report states that resources are levied with nonprofit organizations, but the problem is I have page after page after page of nonprofits, and there isn't any coordination. It's just overlapping programs and fragmentation. I attended the city's success off the streets meeting, but honestly, having one nonprofit explain to another nonprofit what their program is doesn't really coordinate and doesn't help us. The report states in response to increased requests to address blight association associated with unsheltered homelessness, which often takes the form of an encampment. But yet, when I talk to officers, when I talk to neighborhood services, when I talk to the parks to people, I say, what about all the, what about our problems where day and night in our parks, in our businesses, in our neighborhoods, and they say that's not an encampment. So, uh, uh, um, but the report states that from March 10th to August 31st, 2017, the city received nearly 500 complaints related to community impacts. But the report doesn't say how many of those were encampments and how many of those were non-encampments. And I'll be honest with you, I was a little surprised to see that the slide about community involvement. I'm invited to a meeting next Monday, but this report has been in process, has been going on for a long time. Of the folks that I know involved in homeless, I don't know any of us that have been invited to participate in any way. And Vice Mayor, I would love to have come to your meeting when you sit down and discuss this and go to some of your questions. I would appreciate an invitation if possible. My other concern is, is with only 25% of the unsheltered homeless willing to accept services, how are we going to help the other 75%? So I'll be honest with you, my advice to my neighbors, if they have a problem with homeless, will be to call the police and not wait for a process to go through a process. And finally, we're approaching the holidays again this year. For two years, I've asked the city of Phoenix to please come out with an information campaign that will let neighbors know how to really help the homeless, not random acts of kindness. I know what happens downtown. I know that the problems that are resulted from people who are trying to help do, do not understand how to really help. So please, can we do something? I know it's last minute, but quickly, or even in the future, get something out to let people know how to help the homeless, not enabling them but do some do some significant help. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Summer. Can you make sure that she's a part of that community uh, input? Thank you. We have Neil. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. We appreciate all the work that's been done on this. We understand that it's really complicated and. Um, there are a lot of uh, interacting departments on this. With that, I would ask the question again that the vice mayor asked about who's in charge. I didn't hear an answer to that question. I think that's an important thing and I think that helps uh, define who's responsible for what. We understand the coordination, but I think who's in charge is really important. I'm glad that Mo defined engagement before. I think that that's an important thing for council members to keep an eye on. And I would also ask that in the contract, what was the uh, percentage amount that we specified for, um, uh, for the uh, provider to reach? What level of engagement? By the way, I think the, uh, for, for MROPE, when human services involve, is involved in the MRO program, they have cited a 70 cent success rate in the acceptance of services. So that's a really uh, high mark as also. Couple other questions for council in your oversight role. How do we measure success? Um, do we know the percentage of homeless that are on the street that are violent felons or have outstanding felony warrants. We completely concur and understand that there um, is, um, um, being homeless is not a crime, but being out on a felony warrant is. And I think we would probably also want to know who violent felons are and perhaps where they are. Um, are outreach ambassadors conducting case management? And, um, you know, about the program, when you call into the program, how long should residents, citizens expect before that engagement takes place? 
couple other questions. Does outreach and engagement outweigh the need for case management? Does outright outreach and engagement help provide prosecutors and judges with information when people experiencing homelessness appear in court. And again, just finally, I just want to go back to the measurement. In what ways will the success or failure of the outsource program be measured? What are the metrics? I think that metrics are really important to you. You know, we heard about flowcharts a couple of times today and in previous meetings. And really the focus for you should be the results because that's what the citizens are looking for. So thank you. Councilmember Williams. When I was at the sheriff's office and I had the responsibility of all the programs offered to, to inmates in the jails, I learned a couple things. One, I learned that many of the homeless people and or drug addicts timed themselves so that they went back to jail because they knew if they had solely that life, um, their life expectancy was pretty short. They would go back to jail, get sober, eat, get cleaned up, and then go back to the same lifestyle. I'm wondering if part of this process, because we're talking about repeat offenders and putting people in jail, if you have any uh, coordination or cooperation from probation officers and or have you talked to the sheriff to see if he could put in some type of program in the jail um, that our court system could refer them to and say, you know, if you successfully complete this, uh, you could get out two days early or something. So that there's a reward system, but they receive some type of uh, intervention while they're in the system. Um, I can't say that's always long term, but I know that it can make a big difference. And uh, it's just another resource I was hoping you'd look into. You know, I just Councilwoman have, Williams, okay. if you mind. Um, we actually do coordinate with the Sheriff's Department and Correctional Health Services. The City of Phoenix Prosecutor's Office uh, meets with them fairly regularly, both with the Behavioral Health Court and um, Veterans Court and our repeat offender program. There are programs that they do have while people are in custody. They obviously don't have the resources we all would like them to have either. But on the back end, we also bring the case managers from the city of Phoenix and from other partners into the jail or into the courtroom where they're in custody. And we actually have meetings with those individuals at that point to look at what can they do, what programs can they get into, and facilitate picking them up directly from jail into those programs, which is the much more successful model for your repeat offenders. You know, one of the things I'd like to see done is um, creating an org chart, finding out who's responsible for what, um, creating some type of benchmarks, um, so knowing what how can we measure our achievement or if we're even meeting? Um, also, how many of those homeless individuals that we do um, help out or that we do encounter with have criminal records or not? And also to look at what other cities are doing. I mean, we have 1,500 individuals that are homeless within the city of Phoenix, 500 outside the city of Phoenix. How do we make sure that all the cities surrounding our city are taking their fair share and that we're not the ones um, taking the burden because we're good stewards um, trying to help people that we're the ones burdened with all the um, with all the services also and that um, that you come back to this subcommittee with some of those answers and then I know that some of my colleagues have some questions that they would like answered too I think we can stay on this subject for another hour or yeah. so but um, if there's another questions or, or concerns, I think that we should um, bring, it up, bring it up to the committee and maybe have it continue this conversation on our next um, subcommittee meeting. I'm not sure if there's any other questions that are need to be answered before. We... Uh, oh. just first, wanted to uh, thank you for your leadership on this issue. And I think this might be the final public safety subcommittee for Director Gallegos. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it is. So a huge thank you to you for your leadership in getting us to where we are. We have 
a lot of work to do, but I think a great foundation to get started. So I wanted to, maybe we could do a round of, of applause for Director Gallego. I think we're looking for a way to hold back this pension, so he has to work for another five years. So. <laughs> And I, I think not his last subcommittee meeting on this topic, though, we are going to, uh, at the sustainability housing, the Shen subcommittee, we are going to be talking about some of the social services. And I've uh, taken notes on some of particularly Ms. Sumner's comments. As we allocate our social service funds, we ought to make sure that we have the infrastructure so that everyone who's receiving those is coordinating. And I think we have mo many of the people at the table regularly, but there are some other providers who we could do better with. So. I have a couple marching notes, marching orders for other uh, subcommittees in addition to the great work we're doing on public safety subcommittee. As you noted in your opening comments, just about every department is involved with this and so we all need to be working together. Um, I had a whole list of questions but I think Councilman Nowakowski, or Chairman Nowakowski's proposal that we continue this conversation at the next subcommittee is probably the right way to go. All right, Vice Mayor, thank you. You mentioned that you work with case managers. City case managers, or are you working with CBI? So the case managers are actually City of Phoenix case managers, okay. but we still work with CBI connecting those individuals. And then anybody that may have a case manager through Mercy Maricopa or other partners, we work with them as well. OK, thank you. And also, I'd like to uh, recognize our um, director, uh, Michelle Franklin that will be sitting in that hot seat pretty soon that uh, <laughs> Mo's warming up for you. Um, she'll be leaving our um, the directorship at the uh, Phoenix Police Department and moving into our Human Services Department. And um, it's a good transition and, and um, a great connection between Human Services and the Police Department. So um, I feel that it's going to be a great transition. So thank you, but Director. But that was before she witnessed this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> She's not smiling anymore. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Congratulations, Mo, on all your achievements and what you have done. You left definitely your handprint uh, on the city and all your programs. So uh, enjoy. Thank you. What we're going to do is we're going to move up the homeless courts, um, keeping with the topic, and then we're going to continue the rest of the other two items. So if we can have the homeless courts. This is the one I got all excited about. Um, some of my colleagues actually have to leave, so we're going to have to continue this one. We're not going to have a quorum. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we have no call to the public, um, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>